This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. So let me uh, let me see if I can kick start this thing because I have a ton of follow up based on the last couple of episodes. Oh yeah, let's start with that. A couple of quick emails that I wanted to talk about. Sarah Cannon uh, sent us an idea. Where, this is from a while back, but we were talking about power up weapons and how Parents Hammer sort of works a little bit differently because it burns Trollocs. Yeah, and she was trying to make a connection between. Matt's amulet that burns the golem and Perrin's hammer that burns the Trollocs that maybe there's some maybe it's like a Terran Grial of some sort it does seem to be like a similar action that it's maybe it's more than just a power alt weapon but it's actually a a Terran Grial hammer of some kind it could be we don't know that much about it wiki says when used by Perrin it feels warm to the touch this is his hammer I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce it Mahalanar is that is it that easy? <laughs> Mahalanar? Mahalanar. Awesome. One of the few that I can actually pronounce correctly. But it seems to burn both Shadow Spawn and anyone on the receiving end of its blows. It has also proven capable of permanently killing Dark Hounds. Well, we, don't, we only get to see it for a very short period of time. Yeah. And then we got an email from Aaron Cliff. We were talking about Ran being one bound to the Horn of Valir. Rand? Yes whether he's a hero of the horn or not. Yeah. And there's a quote from Robert Jordan uh, regarding the dragon and the dragon reborn. Uh, Is this soul born in any other age or only at the advent and theoretically, of course, the closing of the third age as the dragon, the dragon reborn. Robert Jordan responds, the soul is one of the heroes and bound to the wheel spun out as the pattern wills. It in quotes is born in other ages, but in a non-dragon incarnation to suit the pattern of that age. So I think the key quote there is, the soul is one of the heroes and bound to the wheel. Okay. But he doesn't say heroes of the horn. Exactly. But that that also, that's kind of interesting because it implies that Rand isn't the dragon. He's a dragon. Yeah, I mean, and I think he says in other ages there's a female dragon. I think he's had, had that quote as well. Yeah. So that that doesn't surprise me. I like it. But I you know, I also hesitate a little bit to do too much analysis on quotes reported by someone who asked a question of Robert Jordan at a book signing because I just don't think they're the most conductive situations to ask about subtlety and you know, when you're parsing words about yes, he's one of the heroes, but maybe not one of the heroes of the horn. Yeah, you know it's it's tough for me to take this sort of stuff as canon if it's not in the texts. Yeah, you know, unless it was repeated re- over and over again by Robert Jordan, I really try not to take his word on things because he also may have changed his mind about some of the stuff. Sure, and you know, how do I put this? Uh, like you said, par- parsing words, so mm-hmm. like what. Jordan says there is uh, a hero who's bound to the wheel, but all heroes are bound to the wheel and right. spun out when they need to be. And when they're, yeah, okay. I'm not going to start parsing words. <laughs> right, and that's, that's really, <laughs> but, you know, and, I, I, think, I think he is bound to the wheel. I don't think he's bound to the horn. I think those are different things. And I think they can maybe interact with each other in Teleron Riyadh without necessarily both being bound to the horn. Yeah. So there's there's a another thing where Hawkwing is talking to Rand and he says and and Matt asks am I bound to the horn and he's like no you don't want to be so you're not and then he turns to Rand and he says you could tell him yourself if you only remembered and so I think some but people that's, I mean there's not yeah. all that much to interpret there if you remembered the and time I, we were all standing there and Matt was like. I don't want to be bound to anything, <laughs> right? Which is just a you know a believable thing to, for Matt to say. I think it's just I always interpreted it as like they're all hanging out in Teleron Riyadh, and Matt like had the option to be bound to the horn. And he was like, "Hell no!" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and Rand isn't necessarily either because the horn is bound to him. Yeah, I like that. You know, in the beginning when he says, "You're here, but something's holding me back. I need the banner." You know, the certain 
things have to be fulfilled, despite what the Amberlynn seat says in this chapter, where she says the horn will summon the heroes to fight for anybody. That She's wrong about that. Yeah, I noticed that. But that does imply that Suan doesn't know that because no. she, she's um, down to the three O's. Right. She's wrong. Yeah. You know, which is totally fine. Is it Hawkwing that says that? Yeah, it's Hawkwing point? that says that. That's, uh, I think, at the end of the, the Great Hunt because I can't fight without both you and the banner here. Yeah. There are ingredients that are necessary for the heroes to fight, and the Dragon Reborn is one of them. And I'm heavily paraphrasing, but Hawkwing says something like, if the shadow blew the horn, we just wouldn't do Like, we still have will. They're not bound slaves. They're heroes. Show up and be like, sorry. <laughs> and so that leads me right into some follow-up of Aguin as a hero for the horn. Yeah, we were speculating a little about this, I think, in the, la- the last time we were together, the... People who are alive currently in the third age. Yeah. Soon who to be maybe right. Who may be heroes of the horn, but because they're alive. For instance, Brigida isn't called when the horn is blown because she's alive. Exactly. She's in the world. Although, you know, she's a bit of a weird example because she was ripped into the world rather than born into it. Well, yeah. Or even just maybe characters who become a hero of the horn simply because of the deeds they performed. Or yeah, 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 I think that's how we got into it. Someone who may become a hero. And so Discord, our patrons on Discord took that and like ran with it. <laughs> and like went um our 13 chosen. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've noticed there's there's about a dozen to 13 of you guys who show up live, so that's that's, that's the right amount. <laughs> or, you know, consistently. Consistently. So those are our chosen. <laughs> In particular, Kelsey actually went pretty deep into some of the research. Oh, yeah? I don't see everything. You know, I'm only there. Not always there. And what I, the, what I liked is when Egwene dies, she actually speaks to Rand. It's on page 807. Of, obviously, the memory of light. Rand squeezed his eyes shut, thinking of all those who had died for him, of Egwene, who he had sworn himself to protect. You fool, her voice was in his head, fond but sharp. Egwene, am I not allowed to be a hero too? So that's after she's died, but before the horn has been blown. She would want to be a hero of the horn. Of course she would. She'd be a good hero of the horn too. Yeah. Can you, you know, Egwene tossing fireballs in battle? When you call for the horn? Hmm. How many of the other heroes are channelers? Not a lot. None of the ones we know about. But I do I, I do want to say that there's evidence for channelers in the heroes. But I can't come up with it at, off the top of my head. I have some notes on the heroes of the horn when I was we were t- thinking about doing an episode. There, sh- there should be the same percentage of channeling heroes as in the regular population. But there could be... A lot more or a lot fewer, maybe. The reason we never solidly agreed to do an episode on the heroes is because the, we only have information on a few of them, like Hawkwing and Brigitte Silverbow. But a lot of them, we have almost none. And when you consider, even for like Hawkwing, that's only his most recent incarnation. Yeah. We have nothing on his previous incarnations. Yeah, exactly. Same with Brigitte. So it it just didn't pan out to be like a really good, most of what I was able to find was like a rough description of not even all of them. And there's like a few quotes, mostly from Tom Marilyn. And we could do like a, I'm sure a Brigida episode. Yeah. And we've basically done a Arthur Hawkwing episode. Yeah. That was like our first one (laughs) Uh, (laughs) or second one. Yeah. Second one. Uh, The other email I got was, Aradia sent a f- just really long email, and it touched on some things that we've talked about before, but she brought up a whole bunch of other really good stuff, so I wanted to go through that point by point. Episode 7, she says, Tom isn't in Whitebridge after he's wounded because Moraine passes through just a day and doesn't notice him. I gotta argue with you on that one. I think he's just wounded and healing and laying up somewhere, and just she passes through without noticing him. Oh, yeah. I like the theory. I mean, he wouldn't have made it terribly far. Permanent limp after that. I I think he was healing for a while. He was just... Yeah, in the, in the scene where where Rand is meeting Suan, he says, uh, I heard this stuff from a man called Tom Marilyn who's dead now. And Moraine, like, grunts in the background. 
Well, she knows he's not dead. Yeah, I. But you know, yeah, it's not said. She, she says that she suspects he's alive, but yeah. we don't know if she knows or what she knows or. Well, I was actually just uh, listening to the section where she goes through the red doorway, and I think we've mentioned this before. But right afterwards, she goes right in to Tom's room and starts like basically talking to him like he's going to be her husband. Yeah. There's a great scene. It's just fantastic. And if you know that she was told in the doorway that he's going to get married, all the things she says are just fantastic. She's like, basically like, you have to start taking care of yourself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it's just a great interaction. She's like, how many years am I even going to get out of a non-channeler? An exactly. old man non-channeler. <laughs> uh, and then just all the stuff with, oh, she's a fine looking woman. <laughs> He hides a lot of the flirting going on between them behind his distaste for Aes Sedai. If only she was an Aes Sedai. If only, and then, like, yeah, he gets over it. <laughs> and then the other big discussion that I saw on Patreon was they went deep into Ingtar and Huron and whether he's going to smell him. But we'll get to that in this chapter. Okay. Just because yeah. of the, the, the way Huron's sense of smell specifically works. I think we'll talk about the, that in this, this chapter. Can't smell a dark friend. He says that in yeah. one of the chapters we're about to do. He says that in this chapter. Dark friends just smell like people. But yeah. I mean, does Inktar even do any violence? He just like opens a door and opens well, a couple doors and... The guards are killed. Yeah. Their thro- throats are slit. So would Huron have smelled that violence on him? I thought that was a good theory. But, you know, there was a big battle that night. So maybe he it would have been covered up in a bunch of slaughtering of Trollocs. Maybe that violence covers it up. Or just the stink of Trollocs all over the place would make it hard to detect that Inktar was a murderer. I don't think so. Uh, he says about his talent, each scent is different and they can be distinguished. So like it doesn't... I don't know. We'll talk about it when we get there. Yeah, but totally. he, he explains to Rand what he is and what he can do. I've been asking repeatedly, how does the dagger get into the box? Yeah. Rand puts it in there when he gets it back. Oh. Right? Because he goes, that. it's it's left on top. Fane leaves it on top so that no one will touch the box. Mm-hmm. And Rand grabs the box and the dagger. And he doesn't want to carry the dagger. And he knows how to open the box. So he opens it, puts the dagger inside. And Loyal carries it away. Oh. So it's not actually in the box until Rand gets it back. Shit. Another thing, uh, Changu and Nido will notice they both disappear. Yeah. It's possible that they may have been the ones who actually killed the gar- guards of the gate, even though Ingtar opened the gate. I was wondering about that. Ingtar talks about it, but we know at this point we can't really trust anything that he says out loud. We don't know what his motiv- motivations are. Yeah, he's he's definitely covering up what he's doing. But, you know, that might be one of the reasons why Huron can't necessarily smell him, because he's not the one who did the violence. It's the dark friends who are gone. May have been the ones who cut the throats. So maybe Ingtar didn't do any violence. He just opened up a gate. Yeah. And we do we do know that they disappear. Yeah. So one way or another, they're either... they. I figured they're with Fane. They're with, yeah, he, they've been corrupted by Fane. Whether they were dark friends beforehand or not, I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Any more as far as... Uh... Uh, Moraine versus Leandrin. We speculated that... I was saying that Moraine totally thinks that Leandrin's Black Aja, but she pointed out there's probably a lot of animosity between the Reds and the Blues, and that might just be what's going on. It might not be anything to do with being Black. And and I think she may have taken more overt action against Leandrin if she suspected she was Black. I would think so. I think that's a good point. I think it was probably more just red versus blue, uh, Aja, back and forth. She definitely has a vote for Fane writing the prophecy, not one of the Murdral. I'm okay either way. I don't think it has to be one or the other. The one that was written in Trolloc Tongue? Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I lean towards the Murdral. Mer- I lean towards Murdral, but I, you know, I, I have I, no I, way to back that up. None. So. <laughs> so if you want to say it was Fane, that's fine. He could have totally learned Trolloc Tongue. She said the Pillow Friends thing uh, referenced before Moraine and Suon is in New Spring. So they, it, it it does specifically say Pillow Friends. Yes. So they're not just close, but close. <laughs> Very close. It's only like, it's only implied, right, that 
pillow friends are lovers. It's not. I mean, I don't think it's ever stated, but there's that whole thing where Cod Swain discovers the two sea folks, the two sea folk women who are pillow friends, and she blackmails them because one of them has a husband, and cheating is considered, you know, taboo in her culture, even when it's che- cheating with a woman. And so it's <laughs> really strongly implied. It's not. Uh, it's gotcha. like there's no other way to interpret it. I see. Oh, yeah, and Domine Heart Friends. It happens sort of in the same way with the captured women in Sean Chan. Rolida and Galena, pillow friends? Delana, that's right. That's right, because she tries to rekindle her relationship. She's one of the spies for the Rebel Tower. Yeah. And she tries to come back, and she's ordered to rekindle their friendship. And Elida messes friendship, with her. I'm making yeah. air quotes. And Galena was interested in Pavara. I guess that's. <laughs> I'm looking forward to yeah, seeing, so this, seeing just, this later. There's as a we... lot of relationships going on behind the scenes that are, again, if you're not looking for them, not up and in your face. Yeah. And there's only like a couple of scenes in the book where and it's sex is even it's still only strongly implied. There's no. Well, and what's really disorienting about it is a lot of the women who are pillow friends then go on to have relationships with men and marry or, you know, end up in long term relationships with men. So it it does seem to be that he has this idea of situational lesbianism and doesn't necessarily (laughs) fully incorporate long term lesbianism into his books. Okay, well, I mean, I don't know. It kind of sounds a bit like real life. As, as, I, I mean, without the situational. No, no and, and there is some bisexuality, which is which is fine. But like the whole. Yeah, I don't know. I think people are more fluid than anyone or than a lot of people really want to admit. I guess especially when you're se- spending centuries together. Dan Savage says so. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Dan Savage. I do love his stuff. <laughs> I still um, listen to his podcast sometimes. They They – can go out into the world, but they're treated very differently than normal people. I said I are. Yeah. It's kind of hard to leave. They'll find you in most cases. Yeah. Unless you're Cad Swain. I'm trying to think of rogue I said I. Warren is kind of a rogue I said I. But at any given time, a third of the population of the White Tower is out on business, visiting kings and queens, traveling. Yeah. Just being like Elida was an advisor to a queen. A lot of them are in other countries. Yeah. And there certainly are men, you know, the Greens certainly don't have any problem sleeping with their orders. So there certainly are. It's not like they're forbidden sex or anything like that. Sure. That's also heavily implied. Right. I mean, a lot of the, obviously the ones who marry them, marriage implies sex. Yeah. Are there any current Greens who are married? Oh, I think the one who, um, l- Lan gets his bond pass too. She's marries all her orders. All of them. All, yeah, she marries all of them. Uh, it's implied that the Greens with multiple orders having group sex too, according to snakes and foxes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's uh, sure at least yeah. roughly implied. They call them circles for a reason. Now, right? Everything I say sounds like anyone know. <laughs> oh. The beginning of chapter eight, the dragon reborn, and her symbol is the dragon fang, appropriately. Does the dragon fang always represent the dragon reborn? The dragon reborn or dark friends? Yeah, I think sometimes just like any male channeler. Gotcha. Rand walked stiff-legged and nervous at first beside the warder. Face it on your feet. It was easy for Land to say. He had not been summoned by the Emerald Seat. He was not wondering if he would be gentled before the day was done, or worse. Rand felt as if he had something caught in his throat. He would, could not swallow, and he wanted to, badly. I mean, he gets that arrogant cat crosses the courtyard later. Yeah. But he starts off with this really stiff walk. He's, uh, really, he's, he's really scared. Yeah. Well, he thinks he's going to be gentled. Yeah. And lands escorting him through the women's quarters in Feldara. Uh, and they're both wearing swords, which is also making Rand nervous because he knows he's technically not supposed to wear a sword. But Lan's setting him up in a way that Rand doesn't, really doesn't understand to put on a little bit of a show. So an Inktar gives Rand and Lan a particular look. Do you think that's just because they have their swords on them or do you think he's 
I couldn't think of any other reason for him to give them a particular look. Yeah, I th- what they're doing is pretty um, taboo. You're not supposed to carry a weapon into this portion of the castle. Got it. Ever. But I think because because everyone knows why Rand has been summoned, because of the like super high level of formality, having a sword is um, it's like an understood part of the formality. Because you put your hand on your sword and yeah, when you kneel and. And yeah, exactly. In in the earlier chapter, Lan says, or he like starts off. I'm not going to look back for the quote, but he starts off trying to teach or wants to teach Rand how to how to bow properly. Right. And Rand says, "Oh, I I saw Gawain do it in Camelin, and I think I remember how to do that." And Lan says, "Yeah, that'll give him something to think about." And I think it's bowing like a high prince to a queen. Yeah. Well, which is. You know, possibly like having the sword, and I think in that scene, Gawain just has a knife or something like that. Probably. But he just holds it in the same way. It's all this, you know. He puts his hand on the hilt in the same way. Yeah, yeah. Right hand or something like that. And with every step, Rand grows more tense. As they approach the women's apartments, Land suddenly snapped. Cat crosses the courtyard, startled. Rand instinctively assumed the walking stance as he had been taught. Back straight, but every muscle loose. I interpreted this as this is how warders are walking around all of the time. <laughs> I I think they're a little more... This is a very arrogant walk. The warders aren't walking around arrogantly. They're posed on the edge of like movement and violence, and they, they walk like smooth and glide. This is very much like Maybe. arrogant. Yeah. The, I sort of think of this as sort of like... Your head's in place, but your body's sort of loose underneath it, and you just—it's like a strut almost. Yeah. So like a um, actually think makes me think of a model on a not a catwalk. Uh, yeah, that's what you call it. The the platform they walk out on—it's mm-hmm. called the catwalk. Yeah. So a cat crosses the courtyard immediately makes me think of like a model doing her like one leg in front of the other, like. It was a relaxed, almost arrogant saunter. Relaxed on the outside, he certainly did not feel it inside. He had no time to wonder what he was doing. They rounded the last corridor in step with each other. And of course, he doesn't know what he's saying with it. That's entirely Lan using his training to make him act in a very certain way. Look better. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because he looked like a nervous kid when he was before. Right. And you throw on cat crosses the courtyard and you've got an arrogant asshole. I always love this scene going through it just... Lan with his puppy. <laughs> this is kind of how I see it. Like this is really where you, you get to see like Lan is like invested this time and for some reason really cares. I always suspected, be, you know, at least Lan would have become interested because he's the Dragon Reborn. He's got this sword with all this history to it, and you know, he's the Dragon Reborn. I think he cares because Nynaeve cares. That is would have to be a part of it. I mean, he's he's clearly falling for her. She's got a hold on his heart. Oh yeah. And the things he cares she cares about are the boys. He gives her the ring in either this chapter or the next one, right. I forget. Oh, uh, the next thing I have is Rand showing up at the door when he approaches Leanne. I don't know if you have anything in between. Nisura, one of Lady Amelie's attendants, gives him a look. Yeah. And that reminds him that the you know, once again well, he, it reminds him of what Perrin had said, that Lady Amelisa and Leandrin were looking for him and all of her attendants. Right. So that's that's sort of another reference to Leandrin looking for him. Just so just a reference to that. Uh, were they looking for all of us or just me? Leanne looked Randover with a slight smile. Despite the smile, her voice had a snap to it. What have you brought to the Emerlin Sea today, Land Gaiden? A young lion? Better you don't let any greens see this one, or one of them will bond him before he can take a breath. Greens like to bond them young. (laughs) Rand wondered if it was really possible to sweat inside your skin. He felt as if he was. He wanted to look at Lan, but he remembered this part of the warder's instructions. I am Rand Althor, son of Tam Althor, of the Two Rivers, which was once Manetherin. As I have been summoned by the Emerlin Seat, Lan said I, so do I come. I stand ready. He was surprised that his voice did not shake once. Leanne blinked, and her smile faded to a thoughtful look. 
He's yeah, like making these impressions. Totally. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I like Leanne flirting a little bit right there. Yeah, and she does that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he's tall. She likes the tall ones. She does like the tall ones. Yes, she does. <laughs> Didn't she say something to him at some point? Was that like a couple uh, chapters ago? Well, she said something. Was that to, Leanne? That was Leanne yeah, that she yeah. was talking to, I think, Perrin. Oh, yeah. But I think she kind of... She was like, if I was... Comments at them both. Uh, totally. <laughs> in totally. a sl- maybe slightly predatory way. Yeah. She says something like, where where were you when I was 16 or 30? <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere in there. <laughs> well, and frankly, after she gets stilled, I... <laughs> She's basically back to 25. Yeah, and then when the her stilling is healed, she uh, becomes green. Yep. Yep, totally. She wants to marry her warders. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> this is supposed to be a shepherd, Lan Gaiden. He was not so sure of himself this morning. He is a man, Lian said I. Lan said firmly, no more and no less. We are what we are. The eye said I shook her head. The world grows stranger every day. I like the next line right there. I suppose the blacksmith will wear a crown and speak in high chant. Yeah, maybe well, he will. Yeah, I think he's going to. I mean, if he certainly gets a crown. Yeah, not so much the high chant, but no. You know, she walks into the door and comes back. Uh, I have this part. Leanne returned, motioning Rand to go in. When Lan started to follow, she thrust her staff across his chest, stopping him. Not you, Lan Gaiden. Moraine Sedai has a task for you. Your lion cub will be safe enough by himself. What does she send him to do? Good question. I didn't put any thought into it. In the next chapter, he, all the warders are gathered around except for Lan and all the Aes Sedai. He's the only warder who's not there when they're gathered to leave. So he's doing something right now. And I couldn't find any evidence in a cursory look for what he was doing between this scene and when he shows up again in the next chapter. Hmm. I'm thinking about it. What could he be doing? Moraine sends him to do something. It's not something that involves the horn. Could it be something that involves the banner? Putting it into Rand's saddlebags? Are you reading? And, yeah, I'm reading. Sorry. No, um, I Because, <laughs> like, and he, when he appears in the next chapter, Rand's getting let to leave, and Lan runs up to him and says, all right, here's how you sheet the sword. Okay, good. See ya. And then runs off again. Yeah. It's a really weird scene. I have no idea what Lan could be doing, but he seems to be just like in the, like super busy. I guess, may, is, wait, is he going off to talk to Nynaeve? He does talk to her, but that doesn't mean, I mean. That wouldn't be the task for him. I don't unless think so. She maybe is like, you have to go say goodbye to her. I'm not really sure. Anyway, so if anyone has any ideas about what task Lan is set to do for Moraine. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, me too. Don't know. Maybe we'll get a hint later in here. Lan shouts, Taishara Manetherin, as the door slams in his face. Moraine sat to one side of the room, and one of the brown eyes said I, he had seen in the dungeon, sat to the other, but it was the woman in the tall chair, behind the wide table, who held his eyes. The curtains had been partially drawn over the arrow slits, but the gaps let in enough light behind her to make her face hard to see clearly. He still recognized her, though, the Amarlin seat. Quickly he dropped to one knee, left hand on sword hilt, right fist pressed to the patterned rug, and bowed his head. As you have summoned me, mother, so I have come. I stand ready. He lifted his head in time to see her eyebrows rise. Do you now, boy? She sounded almost amused, and something else he could not make out. She certainly did not look amused. Stand up, boy, and let me have a look at you. He straightened and tried to keep his face relaxed. The next thing Suan says is, sit, boy. <laughs> and Rand refuses, as which is part of ancient formality that Land taught him. The watch is not yet done. She's a little amused, but she's also kind of pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, God damn it. Lan. <laughs> I mean, she even says to Moraine, did you let, uh, yeah, right here. Have you let Lan Adam daughter? This will be difficult enough without him picking up order ways. Yeah. <laughs> exasperated is the word uh, she uses. And I think that's pretty accurate. Lan has been teaching all the boys, mother, This is, Moraine replied calmly. He has spent a little more time with this one than the others because he carries a sword. Again, a bit of a half-truth there. Yeah. You know, I, all, all the reasons that Lan spends with Rand, not only is he to have the sword, not only is the dragon reborn, 
but they also have sort of a deep connection. And Suan knows that he's the dragon reborn. Yeah. Yeah. But it's another one of Moraine's sort of half truths where she constantly is saying, Well, he's Taviran, he's Taviran, he's Taviran. That's true. He's also the dragon reborn. He's also a lot more than that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the brown eyes that I shifted on her chair. The guy didn't are stiff neck and proud, mother, but useful. Which I assume is Varen. I don't know if it's explicitly said in this scene, but well, she says I would not be without Tom Tomas, and Tomas is oh, Varen's there we go. Warder, yeah. so that has to be her. Yeah, even though yeah, it's weird that he doesn't use her name. I guess because it's from Rand's point of view, and he doesn't know who Varen is yet. This is his first meeting with her. Yeah, and I, I think of Varen is such a major character; it's hard to be like, what? what? <laughs> the brown eye said, "I know Varen," and then. Moraine, Suan, and Varen all kind of turn towards each other. The three eyes said I were all ignoring him now. This sword, the amulet in seat said, it appears to be a heron mark blade. How did he come by that, Moraine? Tan Thor left the two rivers as a boy, mother, and this is the first time Rand is hearing this. He joined the army of Ilion and served in the White Cloak War, and the last two wars with Tyr. In time, he rose to be a blade master and the second captain of the Companions. After the Aiel War, Tam Althor returned to the two rivers with a wife from Camelin and an infant boy. It would have saved much had I known that earlier, but I know it now. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about there. First of all, I think Moraine found this, you know, her disappearing and going off to look at things. And while Rand's like, where the hell is she? Some of this is what she's been looking into. Yeah. Rand's birth, his lineage, where he came from. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the... Uh, the fact it would have saved much had I known this earlier, but I know it now. I think we speculated that it was possible that she may have recognized Tam because he was... Suan? That Moraine may have had some idea of who he was. Gotcha. Because he was, you know... An important member of the Ilian elite. Exactly. You know, so obviously this sort of contradicts that theory that she knew exactly who he was, but she was able to find out. Yeah. Fairly quickly. Do you think Tam is just sitting on a pile of money? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I imagine his pay was pretty good. It's Being an elite officer. Yeah. I mean, he and he's on his family farm, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he inherited that, I yeah. assume. Yeah. I don't but... think he came back from war and, like, bought a farm and, like, spent all his gold on it or anything. Or yeah, did he inherit it or build it? I mean, either way. He calls it his family farm. Oh, does he? Yeah. Okay, then... But, you know, then again, he did choose to be out in the Westwoods, which is a hard place. Yeah. So there is an orchard there. So it would have had to have been. But, yeah, I I, I sort of that's a good question. Did he establish? It seems like he would have built the farm for him. Come back from war. That's always what I thought. But I and created the farm for himself and Carrie and Rand. Yeah. Which may explain where all his gold went. Could be, but I I kind of figure he's sitting on a pile of money. He does travel across the country without any help. He's got to have some. I, oh, I'm sure he's got some. Yeah. And probably a, a vast amount of wealth for the two rivers. Anywho. Against here, the Emerlin seat frowned slightly. Well, there was blame enough on both sides in those wars. And she... Um, asks Varen if she can make sure the blade is authentic. And Varen says, yeah, there's tests. Yeah. And Suan says, then take it and test it. You know how I would test to see if a blade is power rot? Hit it with a hammer? Yeah, basically. <laughs> if the hammer breaks, it's power rot sword. <laughs> if the sword breaks, it's not. Well, Varen isn't, uh, she isn't specific, so that very well may be the test. <laughs> I'm assuming she means like a power-based test. Or you could just heat it yeah. a lot and see if uh, it falls that's, apart. That's true. Maybe a non-destructive test. If it's not like a power rot blade, it won't get destroyed. I'm sure there's a way, right? Because the power rot blades are, the power is used to form the metal in a certain way. I'm sure it leaves residue of some sort or some sort of microscopic pattern in the metal. (laughs) The Chosen are speculating about the family farm. Oh, yeah. Our Chosen. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean it is out in the west woods and it says only it you know you have to Not sort a lot of, of people go out there. yeah he definitely chose to go out there so maybe it was like they're saying it was maybe a fixer upper or yeah either way it's possible you know they have i, I a can't well. imagine even tam doing a fixer upper i imagine him building it with his own two hands he would he would 
So, and it would be nicer than anything else in the two rivers. So Ron Swanson esque. <laughs> so she she needles him a little bit, tries to get him to get the sword away, and that's that's always a tender point for Rand. And Don't Rand try and take his sword. Snaps, yeah. I mean, he's it's there's so much emotional baggage wrapped up in that sword with his father and who his real father is. Nobody is taking it from taking it from me. So Suan says, "You have some fire in you, besides what Land put in. Good." You'll need it. I am what I am, Mother. He managed smoothly enough. I stand ready for what comes. The Amarillo seat grimaced. Lan has been at you. Listen to me, boy. In a few hours, Ingtar will leave to find the stolen horn. Your friend Matt will go with him. I expect that your other friend, Perrin, will go also. Do you wish to accompany them? Like she has any question about what Perrin's name is. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect that she knows. She knows. She's like, oh, Perrin? Like, I'm not paying attention. <laughs> like, yeah, this right. isn't really important. And um, Suwan explains what's going on there with the dagger, how it's gone, the horn, all that. Well, and she does something very clever here where she lays out Rand's choices. And the clever part about that is if you say you can do A or B, no, he doesn't think about doing C. Oh my gosh. And I didn't think of this until just now, but Swan lays this out and like says, what do you want to do? They know what he's going to choose. He's going to choose to help his friends. And Moraine has this plan to send him to Ilion, get the horn, arrive in Ilion with the horn, and then have the love of Ilioners. Yeah, have the support of the whole city. So he'll proclaim himself the Dragon Reborn and have an army. So they're pushing him to yeah. go after the horn so he can get it back and then go down to Ilian with it. That's what Moraine wants him to do. Totally. And this whole scene is designed to make him choose that. Yeah. I will ride with Ingtar, mother, Rand says. The Amarillin seat nodded absently. Now that that is dealt with, we can move on to important matters. I know you can channel, boy. What do you know? And you notice how she like... As if she, as if nobody cares. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now that that's done with, whatever. <laughs> no problem. And then let me slam you with this. Like I yeah. know you can channel just to like totally distract you from the <laughs> choice I just had you make. She is manipulating him expertly in this scene. Oh, that's great. I'm glad I noticed that because he does choose to do exactly what Moraine wants him to do. Yeah. It reminds me of when Lan says something like, "Maybe it's a good thing you're leaving." With the way the women are talking. They'll, within a year, they'd have you married in the head of your own house within 10 years and have you thinking you did it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, he he is married in less than a year. Isn't or is it maybe yeah, slightly it, more than a year? year? It, might be, it, it might be. I mean, yeah. the whole book is only like two or three. Or the whole series, I should say. And he does his little, I don't want a channel. And she sort of turns to him and says, yeah, it's that's not a choice. You it's make. not a choice. You're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know because I channel and I know there's no way I could not do it. Even with the, you know. Yeah. You don't want to, the Admiral in seat said. Well, that's wise of you and foolish too. Right. Because you're going to, so learn to control it. Yeah. And he gets all upset and he's like, well, how the hell am I supposed to learn? Yeah. They don't give him any advice. Except Moraine repeating the fish teaching a bird to swim analogy. There is one thing she says. Those who could teach you the male Aes Sedai are 3,000 years dead. No Aes Sedai living can teach you to. I think that immediately gives him, that, that plants the seed that you need someone who's 3,000 years old, which means you need one of the Forsaken, which yeah. means you get Asmodian. Mm -hmm. Sort of the beginning of that seed is, well, he's the only one Rand can learn from. And of course he can learn from the you know memories coming forward in his head from the taint. So it, it's sort of an interesting dynamic that the the more he channels, the more he has access to his old memories and the more he's able to to almost learn from Lewis Theron. He does really need Asmodian, or that really helps him a lot. Oh, yeah. It, it, it gets him, that levels him up quite a bit. But he's lucky he has the flame in the void, which is what happens next. Moraine goes on with the bird and fish analogy. Brand took the interruption to try to regain some control of himself. As Tam had taught him long ago, he formed a single flame in his mind and fed his fears into it, and he creates the void. And I did notice, after Rand forms the void, he says, Why are you talking to me like this, mother? He asked. You should be gentling me. The Amarillin seat frowned and turned to Moraine. Did Land teach him this? No, mother. He had it from Tam Thor. 
So she's able to very easily recognize that he has embraced the void. Yeah. Externally, he, his whole facade must have changed. Right. And somehow, Suan knows, knows exactly what just happened. I mean, certainly the flame in the void is, uh, it's definitely a warder trick. So they would know from the warders. Right. And, and the other fighters. So it's, it's not unknown at their level, but it's odd that a farmer would know it. And of course, paraphrasing, but of course, Suan says, I'm not gentling you because you're the dragon reborn. The void rocked. The world rocked. And everything seemed to spin around him. No, mother. I can channel. The light help me. But I am no Rowland Darksbane, nor Guayira Malasan, nor Urian Stonebow. You can gentle me, or kill me, or let me go, but I will not be a tame false dragon on a Tarvalon leash. Where did you hear those names? The Amarillan demanded. Who told you Tarvalon puts lines on any false dragon? Yeah, just that where he gets those ideas from. Yeah. You know, I mean, Ishmael, basically, from Baal Zaman and his Yeah, dreams. does Tom ever... St- uh, no, he gets... Rand gets the names from Ishmael yes. and then asks Tom about them later. And Tom says they're dangerous names. Yeah. Rand they're just conveniently dragons. leaves them out. Yeah. But I think Tom also speculates in front of him, like, yeah, that may have been what happened. Maybe. That they may have been. May have been false dragons. On a leash. Well, he says it's, like, very possible. Yeah. Where did you hear those names? A friend, mother. He said, a gleeman. His name was Tom Marilyn. Everyone knows who Tom Marilyn is. Well, Rand just doesn't know that. He's dead now. Moraine made a sound, and he glanced at her. <laughs> That's her being like, mm, no, she's not. No, he's not. No. No. <laughs> you are not a false dragon, the Emerlin said firmly. You are the true dragon reborn. I am a shepherd from the two rivers, mother. Daughter, tell him the story. A true story, boy. Listen well. Yeah, I, I had a thought. I wonder if one of the reasons that there were a bunch of false dragons is they were— and that they may have been set up by the Red Aja is actually being set up by the Black Aja in an effort by Ishmael to be able to mess with Rand's head. The whole purpose of those false dragons was so that Ishmael could say to Rand, they're trying to set you up like all these other false dragons. Maybe. It could just be convenience. I mean, creating the false dragons, because these were quite a long time ago. I forget which what the order is exactly, but I'm pretty sure Rowan Darksbane was like a few hundred years after the formation of Tarvalon. This is like a really long time ago. I don't know about all of them. I'd have to look it up. But one of those was like shortly after the breaking. Well, and the list that Ishmael gave, gives him includes Loghain. Oh, that's right. So he doesn't mention Loghain. He do, and he doesn't mention Taim either. Because mm-hmm. I don't think he knows about Taim. Yeah, and he, of course, doesn't mention where he actually heard this from. And then Moraine, at Swan's urging, breaks into the story of how she found Rand, essentially, and what happened. And I like that interspersed with it is Tam's quotes from the first book. Right, and Rand's thoughts. We see um, quotes from Tam while he's having the fever dreams. Mm-hmm. And they sort of match up really closely with the story uh, that... Moraine is telling him. And so those two, you know, in a, in a lot of ways confirm each other and make it impossible for him to deny the truth of the story. Yeah. Kind of confirming everything she yeah. says. Maybe uh, read the prophecy or the foretelling. I don't know if you have that highlighted. And Katara Sidai started up out of her chair, her arms and legs rigid, trembling, her face as if she looked into the pit of doom at Shale Ghoul, and she cried out, he is born again. I feel him. The dragon takes his first breath on the slope of Dragon Mount. He is coming. He is coming. The light help us. Light help the world. He lies in the snow and cries like thunder. He burns like the sun. And she fell forward into my arms, dead, from Moraine's perspective. Right. So, and I guess only she, Suan, and the Armalin Seed at the time heard that prophecy. Only three people heard it. Yeah. I guess there were four of them, including her. An anchor is not demeaned by being used to hold a boat, the Amarlin said. You were made for a purpose, Randall Thor. When the winds of Tarman guide unscour the earth, he will face the shadow and bring forth light again in the world, which is a quote. The prophecies must be fulfilled, or the Dark One will break free and remake the world in his image. The last battle is coming, 
and you were born to unite mankind and lead them against the Dark One. Belzaman is dead, Bran said hoarsely, and the Amaranth snorted like a stable hand. Yeah, he's not dead. Not even Baalzaman isn't even dead. Ishmael isn't even dead. Yeah, just much less. Injured. Yeah, not only are you did you not kill the Dark One, but you didn't even kill the guy you were fighting. <laughs> Next thing I have is, what are you going to do with me? Rand asks. Nothing, the Amaralyn said, and he blinked. It was not the answer he had expected, or the one he had feared. You say you want to accompany your friend with Ingtar, and you may. I have not marked you out in any way. Some of the sisters mu- may know you are Taverin, but no more. Only we three know what you truly are. Your friend Perrin will be brought to me, as you were, and I will visit your other friend in the infir- infirmary. You may go as you will, without fear that we will set the Red Sisters on you. Again, that manipulation where she's like, you say you want to accompany your friend. Yeah. Well, she gave him two choices, and yeah, he chose that. But it's not like, (laughs) I I don't know. Her her manipulation of him is so good there. You know, the whole reason that they are willing to let him go and not gentle him. You know, they, they talk about it a lot, but the prophecies must be fulfilled. We let you walk free, knowing what you are, because otherwise the world we know will die, and the Dark One will cover the earth with fire and death. Mark me, not all I said I feel the same. There's some here in Faldara who would strike you down if they knew a tenth of what you are. Yeah. And feel no more remorse than gutting a fish. Just that fish analogy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get more of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is sort of the schism of the White Tower. That is the schism that ends up breaking the White Tower that gets amplified is the idea of whether or not the Dragon Reborn should be allowed to go free. Yeah. Or whether he should be pulled in and controlled. They could gentle him or burn him to a crisp where he stood, and he no longer cared. And then I just have the last part. A part of Lan's instructions came back to him. Left hand on the hilt, he twisted the sword behind him, catching the scabbard in his right. Then he bowed, arms straight. By your leave, mother, may I depart this place? I give you leave to go, my son. Straightening... He stood there a moment longer. I will not be used, he told them. There was a long silence as he turned and left. There's a little short section here where we switch to Moraine's point of view. It's like barely a paragraph. The silence stretched on in the room after Rand left until it was broken by a long breath from the Emerlin. I cannot make myself like what we just did, she said. It is necessary, but did it work, daughters? I assume what she just did was manipulating him to go after the horn. Yeah, set him on the path. Right. They're saying that was that was a deliberate thing that we did. And Varen kind of confirms what we were just talking about when she says, um, maybe we will have to gentle him. And sh- then she second guesses herself and she says, but we can't, can we? No. The light forgive us for what we were loosing on the world. It's just Varen being a little airheaded there. I wonder how much of that's an act. Who knows? A lot of what she is is an act. She straight up says to Suan and Moraine that she knows that Rand is a dragon reborn before they even tell her, before yeah. the scene. Yeah, this, I think this is all an act. On That's why she's allowed to be in the room at all. Yeah, and, I mean, otherwise she can blackmail the hell out of him. Yeah. Then uh, we switch to the Nynaeve's perspective. A lot of perspective switching in this chapter. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of reading. I hope yeah. it's not annoying. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> get used to it. <laughs> there was a storm coming. Nynaeve felt it. A big storm, worse than she had ever seen. She could listen to the wind and hear what weather would be. All wisdoms claimed to be able to do that, though not many could. Nynaeve had felt more comfortable with the ability before learning it was a manifestation of the power. Any woman who could listen to the wind could channel, though most were probably as she had been, unaware of what she was doing, getting it only in fits and starts. This time, though, something was wrong. Outside, the morning sun was a golden ball in the clear blue sky. This is something we see Nynaeve doing a lot, where she's no longer sensing the weather with her... She knows she's not using her sense to sense weather. She's using it to sense danger and trouble. Yeah, I kind I kind of interpret it, and here's an you know another thing I have nothing to back up, but I sort of interpret it as like as a village wisdom, you're plugged in very much plugged into the weather because you know everything around you is plugged into the weather. A storm affects all the farmers around you. When you're a village of farmers, the most important thing you can foretell or sense coming is going to be a storm right so it's like important and relevant to her life but as her life shifts here and as her life changes she starts sensing what's important and relevant to her life which is world events you know and so she she interprets it as like her old feelings where she's 
feeling what's important. But in reality, she's feeling, I don't know, time and guide on? Just coming change. I think it's closer than that. I think it's more... So I think it's just maybe the end of the book. Yeah. I do. At the end of that paragraph, she says, she could still feel the good weather too, lasting for days yet, but that was muted under the other. And so this is the last sort of the fading... Oh, I didn't even catch that. ...weather sense that's going away. So she's sensing two different things, both yeah. the good weather and the bad storm that's coming. And the storm that's coming is very much not the good weather. A blue finch per- perched in an arrow slit like a mockery of her weather sense. When it saw her, it vanished in a flash of blue and white feathers. She stared at the spot where the bird had been. There is a storm, and there isn't. It means something. But what? And what we just speculated is what. Right after that, far down the hall, full of women and small children, she saw Rand striding away, his escort of women half running to keep up. And that just reminds <laughs> me of all the scenes where we see Rand in like the stone being followed by a bunch of maidens. Oh, yeah. Just that that seeing Rand at a different at a distance with a bunch of women following him around seems to be something that happens a lot <laughs> for the rest of the book. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and the, the next couple of pages is kind of naive in her own head, uh, thinking about being the village wisdom and worrying about having abandoned her people. And this is something she struggles with for quite a while. She comes to a decision here because she tells Aguine shortly to no longer call her the wisdom. That's right. So I think she really comes to a decision that – and a realization that if she's going to pursue her training in the White Tower, she can no longer call herself a wisdom of the two rivers, of, of Emmonsfield. Yeah, she has to kind of give it up. She has to make a choice. And she has Egwene start calling her naive instead of wisdom here. So this is really, I think, the first time where she admits to herself that she is not – going to be the wisdom of Emmons Field anymore. Yeah. Who do they end up making the wisdom? I can't remember. Days Conger. That's three votes from the Chosen. It's probably right. It's almost <laughs> definitely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and don't they get a couple of... One, once they start to really grow in size, don't they get a couple of like healers and wisdoms who come over the Is mountains right? from the Almuth Plain? Sounds right. I mean, the whole Two Rivers area becomes fairly metropolitan. It yeah. sort of gets back to Manetheran size. And one wisdom isn't going to be able to handle that. Getting there. Close to, you know, city size. Do you want to talk about the land stuff at all? I mean, I only have, uh, I only outlined a little bit here. Uh, She comes up on land and they have a bit of a conversation. I really just kind of outline that he gives her the ring and they, this is the moment where they both kind of acknowledge to each other, like that they have feelings for each other. Land says, you know, this probably can't ever come to anything for various reasons. She's kind of pissed at him because he's trying to say, we can't be together because I am have this death wish, basically. And she's interpreting that as him being like, we can't be together because I'm a king and I'm too good for you. A little <laughs> bit. You know, it's not, she doesn't believe that, but she's sort of internalizing that a little bit. In any case, a king does not give gifts to a village woman, and this village woman would not take them. You know, so there's a little <laughs> bit of that, and he's got to talk her down off of that. And then, you know, there's just some back and forth in relationships, negotiating his vendetta with him being a king, with her being a village woman. But, of course, like, she's going to be Aes Sedai. He doesn't care if she's a village woman. It doesn't yeah. matter to him. They leave that behind the second she's able to channel. I do have her vision blurred at the edges. If I cry now, I will kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I mean, this whole chapter is just, I think, one of the reasons why I love Nynaeve is that we, like, we get into her head and she has these internal contradictions that are so human. Sure. Yeah. In a way that a lot of other characters aren't. <laughs> and uh, it just, it, it makes me fall in love with her, that she actually feels like a person with this. Yeah. Nynaeve is always one of my favorite characters because she feels like a really real person because of all her flaws. Exactly. If you read it at its surface level, it's very easy to dislike Nynaeve, but the second you start going beyond the surface, you're like, oh, she's amazing. Yeah. So he ends up like forcing, basically forcing the ring on her. It's like, I love you, goddammit. Take the fucking ring. (laughs) It's like a a useless piece of scrap metal anyway. It really doesn't mean that. It's really meaningless. Which is a lie. Well, yeah. He's like... Are you kidding? He has There's huge some who meaning. Would respect it. But it's, you know. It's telling her that he loves her. Yeah. 
It's basically it an is. engagement ring. It's symbolic, but he he does say something like, you know, send it to me or a message marked with it and I will come to you without delay and without fail. This I swear. That's huge. That means he will drop Moraine in a second to be there for Nynaeve if she calls. And it does come in handy on a couple of occasions in the future that she happens to be carrying this ring. There's a couple of Malkyrie, I think, that see it and yeah. give her aid. Or a few Borderlanders. Yeah, any warder will help, will help her. I mean, Lan is well known. Yeah, she uses it in, um, to create the Malkyrie army. I mean, that's how she proves he's her husband. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's... This This is basically an engagement right here. This Will is my a husband proposal. ride alone? Clutching the ring tightly, she turned around and jumped when she found herself face to face with Moraine. How long have you been there? <laughs> not long enough to hear anything I should not have, which implies that she was. Not long enough to hear anything I should not have? Moraine thinks she should hear everything. <laughs> that means she heard, she could have heard everything. We have a little bit of confirmation <laughs> to say that she does hear everything. <laughs> Virtually everything. She knows yeah. She's listening, well, literally. We, we were just wondering what thing did Moraine send Land to do? Well, it seems like he went right to Nynaeve. I wonder if Moraine was like, you need to go deal with, with Nynaeve before we leave. Maybe. I think that's exactly what Maybe she did. Maybe Moraine shows up and like, hey, I told you to do something. <laughs> <laughs> she would send him to deal with Nynaeve. Well, not necessarily to break up with her, but just like, this is something you have to deal with before we go. She says, uh, we will be leaving soon. I heard that. Well, I went back and looked at the conversation. He says, I must go now. Nynaeve Mashira. So that means even if she only heard that last bit, she certainly heard Lan call Nynaeve his beloved. Yeah. Is that what that translates to? Yeah, I looked it up. It's it's like the beloved, a, a lost love. Is basically what it means. I love you. It's basically saying I love you and we can't be together. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then we cut into a conversation between Moraine and Nynaeve. Moraine sort of explains that none of the boys are under threat. and She pulls out her t- Taviran lie again. The Amarillo will be seeing all three. Nynaeve, Taviran are not so common that she would miss the chance to see them together in one place. And again, it's just her lying. But I don't, I don't have a whole lot here. But, you know, we, we see yeah. Moraine kind of brings the rivalry out into the open. So this is, again, what makes me think that Moraine sent Land to deal with her because she also then went in right behind her. She's putting herself out there as a target. She's making Nynaeve work hard. And there's a lot going on here. Uh, we see in the scene in one of the previous chapters, Moraine says, I've brought two young girls from the two rivers who will definitely go either blue or green. Mm-hmm. It's not really... I don't think it's explicitly said that Nynaeve is going to go to the tower until this scene. I mean, we know it. And I guess... And she's not going to be blue or green, though. She actually turns out to be yellow. Yeah. But yeah, there's got to be a little bit of of jealousy there on Moraine's part. I think she even says that, like, she unexpectedly feels some jealousy. You know, this is the first time that Lan's really fallen for a woman in a 20-year relationship. And then we switch to Egwene's perspective. A queen watched the liveried maid folding her dresses into a leather-covered travel chest. Still a little uncomfortable, even after nearly a month's practice, with someone else doing what she could very well have done herself. I feel that way whenever I'm at... It's one of the reasons... Um, I do it, too. I like to sit at bars rather than at tables, because I don't... I feel like I'm being waited on less. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do that sort of thing, too. I don't really like food. I don't know. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It's- People carrying stuff for me. It's why I don't like getting gas in Oregon. (laughs) I don't like people doing things for me. And in Oregon, in case you don't know, you cannot pump your own gas. Oh, yeah. I read they just uh, changed that in some rural counties. Yeah, if it's under 40,000 people, you can... There's, like, basically the gas station's small enough that if there's no attendant available, you're now allowed to get out and pump your own gas. But that doesn't apply for anything anywhere near Portland. Yeah, and it's only at night. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I mean, just any time I can minimize human inter- interaction, that I'm all about that. So just rolling down my window and saying to the guy, fill up on regular and handing my credit card, I always feel awkward doing that. I grew up in New Jersey, so I learned how to drive there, and it was just natural. To, I didn't pump my own gas until later. Oh, yeah. 
So have you ever lived in a place where you pumped your own gas? Oh, yeah. I mean, I lived in California for a while. And okay. Christine was lived near where I lived. Kinalon. I had some friends there. Uh, the closest I ever came to Jersey was Philly. And that's not the nicest part of Jersey. Yeah. Philly's like almost, it's like the capital of South Jersey. <laughs> it's not New Jersey at all. <laughs> yeah, basically. I Unless mean, you call it Atlantic City, which is... Ugh. <laughs> I did go to Atlantic City once. I've only passed through. I never really hung out, but I'm, I don't really like gambling. So I have never had a more miserable weekend in my life. <laughs> I was unhappy from the moment I walked into the city until the moment I left. Yeah, I figure if I were going to go to one of those places, it would be for like a convention or if I had to go, I'd probably just spend the time drinking. Yeah. Well, I couldn't get a drink to save my goddamn life. In Atlantic City? It was, I mean, because they were all like watered down and you have to like I, track down one of the waitresses and like it was I've just never a spent weird much space. time there. Yeah. It was, I did not enjoy it. I've literally just passed through. I've yeah. never even stayed there. Well, we tried to do the whole gambling thing, but without a lot of money. Yeah. And it doesn't really work. <laughs> I always say, if it were like likely that you were going to win money, the casinos would already be out of business. <laughs> this is a dumb thing from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> they make a lot of money. <laughs> and that doesn't just appear out of thin air. That comes from all the people who are pulling those levers. Duh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get gambling. I have, like, played poker with friends and stuff like that. You know? Even that gets me too upset. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. I do not do well. I do not do well with the gambling. I get all flustered. And, like, it's, I can barely uh... play regular, like, n- cards without any money on uh, the table without for... getting upset. For a while, I played, like, a $5 buy-in game with a big group of guys. So, like, from the beginning, I'm like, worst thing that happens is I lose $5. Yeah. For, like, hours of entertainment, you know? So you bet, you're betting with, like, pennies, basically. I did that a few times. That was okay. But I'd rather just play cards. I don't know why the money has to be involved. Yeah, it makes it more interesting. Yeah. I'm not that kind of person. Yeah. I don't, I don't really like it either. I do like the booze, though. Yeah, yeah. No, the the drinking was good. But that has an obvious benefit. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen's perspective. She shortly run in, runs into Nynaeve. I don't have a ton here to highlight. I, I just thought it was funny. She expected she might not be home for Beltine in the spring, or even the Sunday after that. Yeah. Never go home. Never going home. Lord Rand, Nynaeve snorted. The young man is growing too big for his breeches. When I get my hands on him, I'll lord him. I don't know why I like that, but I like that. And Egwene goes to talk to him. Uh, and this is where Nynaeve says, I don't think you should call me wisdom anymore. Any longer. Yeah. Oh, I also noted that she says, the best of men are not much better than housebroken. Nynaeve paused, then added half to herself. But then the best of them are worth the trouble of housebreaking. Of course, as she thinks about Lan. Yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about how a queen is really unable to even contemplate marrying a man who can channel. Well, yeah, I mean, the, well, you know, Min and Elaine and Avienda never seem to have any issue with that. Now, Avienda, I get it's probably more cultural, but you know, it, it was always interesting to me that when Elaine and a queen get into the same room, Aguine says, you can't marry him. He's going insane. And Elaine says, you can't. I, have, you know, I, I think he's really he like, she's like, I'm, if you're going to drop him, I'm going to pick him up. There's it's this interesting block that Aguine can't get past that none of the other that Elaine certainly has no problem with. Hmm. Maybe it's kind of an excuse that she says to herself because she knows she doesn't really want to. Yeah. I mean, is Gawain that much better? All right. So here's my theory. He's such an obnoxious character later. I think Egwene ended up with the wrong brother. I think if she'd bonded Galad as her order, A, since he's Rand's half-brother and she's already attracted to Rand, I think there's like a nice symmetry to her marrying his half-brother. Yeah. B, if he would have done what's right, which would have been support his Aes Sedai. Yeah, and not go off and die. Like yeah, a dummy, and be a moron. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I don't really like Gwen very much. No. I'm sure so there are fans out there, but he I starts think he's off. Like... No, he's a use. He's one. Of, he's frequently <laughs> voted the most useless character in the entire series, and he had a chance for redemption and just uh, was written, you know, as a moron for the whole last three books. I mean, he really, and then his whole like 
will he won't he with the white tower he's he's terrible <laughs> every everybody is agreeing yeah. with us in discord <laughs> but i i think that if instead she'd been with galad it would have been a relationship that worked he could have been there I see what you're saying. That would have been an interesting match, mm-hmm. even just as far as, uh, you know, I said I order and not, you know, necessarily with the romantic. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, she says she's super attracted to him anyway, and he's a, there's a point where they're flirting. Yeah. When they first meet. And she ends up, like, being more attracted to Gawain, partially because of Elaine's ridiculous, well, not ridiculous, but her prejudice against Galad sort of points Egwene to fall in love with Gawain, yeah. even though she initially has this, like, relationship with Gawain. <laughs> she should have had both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she would have been green if she... Yeah, she, totally. She could have, she could have bonded she, them yeah, both. Yeah, she had the, tr- the ability to choose. And you still could have had Gawain's whole morality struggle where he had to choose between the woman he was sworn to and his duty to do the right thing, as opposed to his struggle, which was between the white cloaks sort of philosophy and doing the right thing. And yeah. And so he, he still had that sort of, he had to come to realize that the things had gray areas, but you could Mm -hmm. still do that through his whole journey as, as a warder. Sure. I would have much rather seen Gallad as a warder than Gawain. And I think Gawain would have been more interesting as the captain of the white cloaks. And apparently Jordan said he switched the names of the brothers at some point. What do you mean? Gawain and Galad? Yeah. I remember reading an interview that he like wrote the first book and Gawain's name was Galad and vice versa. And he had to like go through and replace them all. Huh. I may be remembering that. To- that's pulled Why? out of the depths of my memory. So that may be completely wrong. I mean. But I remember him like complaining that he had to go back through the first like rough draft by the world and make that. He decided to make that switch. And he was like paranoid that he would have missed one and had a, a Galad in a Gawain scene and vice versa. So I think it just makes, it would make a lot of sense to have their personalities switch places as well. And I would have been really interested in that story. Yeah, it would have. So and then Egwene sort of over watches the conversation between Rand and Algamar. Do not let the horn seize you, Rand, Algamar said. It can take hold of a man. I know how it can. And that is not the way. A man must seek duty, not glory. What will happen will happen. If the Horn of Valir is meant to be sounded for the light, then it will be. And then Egwene arrives. I will leave you in her hands, Randall Thor. Remember here, her words are law, not yours. There's a little bit of a Borderlander custom fleshing out of the society in here. Yeah, where we learn about how the women's apartments works. Mm-hmm. and So Egwene and Rand meet up. Uh, I really don't have a lot there. She asks him about the Amelin seat. Yeah. He he runs with the Taviran lie that Moraine tells. Yeah, he gives her a one-line response. What did she want with you, Rand? Nothing important. Taviran. She wanted to see Taviran. <laughs> Almost convincing himself. And they talk about Fane a little bit. She doesn't remember anything that happened. So you, it's it's interesting that we have... I bet that that's in there because otherwise she would have seen and recognized Ingtar as the traitor. Oh, yeah. Because they must have been conscious and then attacked from outside the jail. Just knocked out. Yeah. So she has no memory of what happened. Rand says basically he doesn't want to be a puppet, and too many people know that he's the Dragon Reborn already. I'm not a puppet. You're a puppet. Scrubbing her cheeks, Aguin followed the other woman. Take care of yourself, you wool-headed lummox. Light, take care of him. This is kind of their saying goodbye. Mm-hmm. A confirmation that they're going off to change. Yeah. He's going off to deal with the fact that he can channel and she's going off to become Aes Sedai. And we have this really unintimate scene where they're both kind of not really talking about what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a formality that they're doing this. I mean, they care about each other, but they're also... Di- their paths are diverging. Definitely. And that's the end of chapter 8. Take care of yourself, you wool-headed lummox. Light, take care of them.
I mean, at some point we're just gonna like do an episode on every single character, but I think the dark are worth episodes because they're uh, uh, a lot of what they do is sort of hidden in between other episodes. You don't get a lot of POE stuff from them, so you kind of have to deduce what's actually going on with the Forsaken from a bunch of other clues. Yeah. Because they have disagreements all the time, and they're sending Trollocs to do different things in the same battle. A lot of things you don't realize till later, like in the scene that I just put up in Discord with Masana and Shada Haran in Crossroads of Twilight without looking at my notes. I think that's right. Seems right. It's all from Aldearen's perspective. She just refers to Masana as the Chosen because Masana appears with I, I, what I assume is a mask of mirrors and like as the black and silver like apparition. She appeared like ghost-like. She appears. Yeah, I think she might be even be levitating a little bit or something. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know who she is until you kind of deduce it. Oh, but yeah, an, an episode on Shadar Haran. Am I pronouncing that right? Shadar Haran. Shadar Haran. The yeah, that would he would be a great episode by I'm himself. Modding. I'm actually gonna put that in. I have a <laughs> word document that's just episode ideas. <laughs> and for the record, I use Open Office, not Word. Just throwing it out there. If anyone cares, <laughs> I'm a text edit guy. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, the default text editor on the Mac. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, there's some tools in like regular word programs that are just better. There are. There are. Of course, when I'm writing notes about the Wheel of Time, it like corrects everything that I write because it's all about Sean Chan and Sea Folk and Elfin and <laughs> none of which are words. Uh, that's why I like the, the simpler text editors, the ones that don't have a lot of those automatic features built in, because I just want to, I mean, yeah. even just the red underlining is just insane all over this document from oh, yeah. all the names and all the words that are just totally made up. I just started teaching it like the names of the Forsaken and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a word now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like sometimes we talk in words that wouldn't make any sense to anybody else. Yeah. You know, like like any decent profession gets their own lingo and dialect that you really have to work there for a while to pick up. Sure. I have one or two friends that um I'm passively working on the new the uh the other podcast idea with mm-hmm. and um my buddy I'm not gonna say his name because we're not sure if he's gonna put his real name on it or not. Is uh, to, has been he listens to the Watt Spoilers podcast sometimes, but he hasn't okay. read anything. He just like when I talk about talking in a mic and like the you know kind of physical stuff, things you have to get used to, and sort of listening as a friend and also as a bit of research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May not want to use his real name because he was a government employee, and we're going to be talking about current events and things. So if he you know has unpopular has opinions. opinion yeah unpopular opinions it might destroy his career potentially in the future so he may just um post for my computer and if if anyone really wanted to find out they could probably find out but he's not a politician he's a bureaucrat i mean i put my name on all this stuff because i figure if anyone wants to know who's doing it i'm also not putting out a lot of uh, political opinions at this point yeah this or, is so benign, like what we're right. doing. You talk about fantasy novels is like, for people who don't read fantasy novels, they just don't really care. It's like, oh, you make a podcast? Cool, man. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> That's pretty much the reaction. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, sometimes they'll be like, it's about a book. And they're like, oh, really? What's the book? And I show it to them. And I'm like, oh, that's, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very thick. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Game of Thrones-ish. And they're like, oh, uh, like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's, I mean, unfortunately, that right now is the litmus test you have. It used to be, it's kind of like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And people would react. It's- and you'd be like, oh, well, the way I used to describe it growing up is it's Lord of the Rings without all the really dry writing. <laughs> yeah, Lord of the Rings, but less boring. Exactly. Now it's Game of Thrones, but not as in your face violent. Yeah. I say it on like every episode. Maybe you should just edit this out, but I've been fixing to read the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Haven't done it. Um, but no, I, I want to leave it in cause I want to see how many times I can get you to say, <laughs> I'm uh, planning on reading the Lord of the Rings seven years from now. We're finished. Girlfriend this podcast. is a big fan <laughs> and she lent me all the books, but they're just like sitting on my desk. But she, she also got me, um, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology for Christmas or my birthday. I forget which they're pretty mm-hmm. close. And, uh, I started reading that, which is cool. Um, 
It's basically just Neil Gaiman. I actually have it on me. Not that it matters. It's the paper. It's basically Neil Gaiman retelling the old Norse myths, like some of the stories um, in like, a, you know, it's enjoyable. I really like the reading the his take on the Norse creation myths. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was. They're very strange. <laughs> There's like a, a cold world made out of mist and a hot world made out of fire. And, and at some point before anything existed other than that, they touched. And in between where it's warm, that's where we live on Earth. That's kind of cool. Yeah. There's a lot more to it. I'm yeah. not doing it justice, but and it also makes sense for like, as far as, you know, people who would never have traveled, even if you were sailing a lot more than a few hundred miles, like you could tell that it's a little colder in one spot and a little warmer in, in another. And you're just like closer to one realm where the frost giants come from and the hot or the hot realm where um, some other, there's another figure that lives there. It's cool. I, I, I love that stuff. Yeah, I might have to borrow that from you. Yeah, sure. I'm. A, I'm I'll probably rip through it. It's not that big. Oh yeah, no, that's what a two fifty three hundred page book. Yeah, yeah, like two seventy, almost three hundred. Introduced me to some characters that I wasn't aware of. Like Odin had two brothers, and you know, talks about Midgard and cool creation myth. Yeah. I also want you to read uh, the Broken Earth series. Yeah. Been harping on that one a little bit. That is such a good series. Nice trilogy. I think it's a really, really well told story with really interesting characters and a really interesting magic system. So it sort of combines all the things I love about fantasy. And it's got a bit of a narrative twist in the beginning by being in the second person for a while, which is a bit hard to get used to, I think, for the first 100 pages or so, but it works really well with the story. Uh, I think she pulls it off. Wait, second person is... You. So someone's telling you about what you did? First person is I. Yeah. yeah. Second person is you. Third person is... They. Uh, yeah, basically what we have in The Wheel of Time, where you get to see their thoughts. Yeah. Third person omniscient, you get to see everybody's thoughts, whereas we usually stick with third person... I'm not sure if there's a name for that. Third person, it's just third person with, in a single person's head. I'm looking at examples. It's usually used in advertising. Mm, yeah, Mom's that makes like, sense. you used Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this this ends up being, well, I don't want to say it, what it ends up being because I think that's part of the discovery. Gotcha. I feel like I could already guess, but I won't. Yeah. I'll read it eventually. I saw Rafe Jenkins posted a picture of his beat up old Wheel of Time books. And I put a comment on that, and he liked my comment, so I was pretty happy about that. It oh, was yeah. on Instagram. It made me kind of want to, I don't, I only have the great hunt with me, but it made me want to post something similar and like tag him in it, because my copy of um, The Eye of the World is looks the same as his. It's missing the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> it's all tattered, written in. I, I can't keep a copy of Eye of the World that long. I keep giving it to people, and it it gets passed on, and... Like I said, I think I've gotten four or five people started on the series. I I gave my original Eye of the World, or my original Wheel of Time books away a long, long time ago in one of my many moves. They got, unfortunately, I didn't have room for my book collection, and they got given oh, yeah. to uh, Good Homes. So I've had to restart my book collection, which I've I've always regretted. Did we do uh, the Magic Systems? That was live, right? Was it? Yeah, but I think we did it at some like on a Saturday, and so I think we only had like one or two listeners. Gotcha. Yeah, you know I'm glad to do it live, but we never. The number of people that actually listen to us live is what a one percent of our listeners, something like that. Yeah, maybe two percent. A dozen at most yeah. out of a thousand or something. a thousand or or so. Oh, you guys are great. We love having you live. It makes us feel special. It really right does. <laughs> the, cho- the chosen of the wheel of time. Okay. Yeah, that's all thirteen of you. <laughs> There's a hard limit on this channel. There's only uh, thirteen. You can like come back and be resurrected as another <laughs> fourteen if you include Timber. <laughs> I mean, he does listen to every single podcast we do. He's he's live at all of them. 
Oh, I don't want to name everyone in Forsaken because then someone has to be Bilal. Oh, you guys, I have to hide the Discord sometimes when I want to start because you guys are so distracting. I just want to like read along and oh, enjoy okay. the comments. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?